Gentlemen, would you take your seats, please? I'm Ross McPhee. I'm from the museum's vertebrate zoology division, and I'm standing in for our usual host, Ian Tattersall, who uh, is not going to join us for the lecture. I want to welcome you, therefore, to the 83rd annual holding of the James Arthur Lecture on the Evolution of the Human Brain. Mr. Arthur was a, was a designer and very interested in mechanisms of all sorts. And as we say on our website, the mechanism that he was most interested in is that one that is most delicate of all, the human mind. I'd like to invite those of you who are here for the first time to pick up flyers at the entrance if you'd like to receive further notifications of future James Arthur lectures or to obtain published versions of past lectures. In recent years, we've had many different kinds of lectures on many aspects of the evolution of the, of the human brain from neuroanatomists, from neurobiologists, from cognitive scientists, even neuroeconomists and philosophers of mind. But throughout all of this, the, the sort of the background or, the, or the, the, th the thing that is always there is the notion of language, because of course that's our mechanism for communication, and in many regards it's one of the most distinctive aspects of Homo sapiens. It's however been a very long time since we've had somebody speak to us whose central interest and specialization is language as such. And I don't think we've ever had a speaker who has approached it from quite the computational aspect that Professor Bob Berwick has. Professor Berwick is a professor of computational linguistics at MIT. Remarkably, he manages to hold a joint appointment there between the departments of electrical engineering and computer science and of brain and cognitive sciences. So he is quite clearly between several stools. He's been brave enough in his research to address the very mysterious interface between syntax or arrangements and patterns of thought in the human mind, and thence to the extraordinary cognitive array that marks human beings as so unique and unprecedented. He's co-authored extensively with his colleague, Noam Chomsky, who I'm sure needs no introduction. And he has written seven books, the most recent of which was published just last fall, Rich Languages from Poor Inputs. His title tonight is Songs to Syntax, Cognition, Computation, and the Origin of Language. Please welcome Dr. Robert Berwick. Let's see if that works. Does that microphone work? Yes? Not so well. I'll... Actually, someone took my other notes down from here. Is that okay now? Actually, someone took my notes. <laughs> Mr. McPhee took my notes. My host did. So it's fine. He could give the talk in, a, in my absence anyway, I'm sure. No, I, I first wanted to thank the uh, my appreciation to the American Museum of Natural History and especially to the uh, members of the James Arthur Lecture Series for their gracious invitation. I suppose like uh, perhaps like many of you, uh, some of my earliest memories of natural science and natural history are when I was two to three or four years old and I would be brought here and uh, I would wander among many of the exhibits, some of them like the, the African elephant exhibit, uh, would uh, leave an impression, perhaps like this one. That's not exactly my memory, but uh, it does serve me well. And so I, I wanted to, to thank them, especially for, uh, be, for giving me this chance to, in part, repay this, uh, this experience, which has shaped a large part of my life. So, so indeed, tonight I wanted to talk about the origin of talking and language itself. And as we know, this is something that's very singular, something that uh, Alfred Wallace, the co-discoverer of evolution by natural selection, sometimes called man's moral capacity and essentially the human capacity. And what I want to actually try to do is to show you that although language, in fact, is very complex, I'll tr I'm, I will try to show that it emerges very simply 
out of the combination of two elements that we see elsewhere in the animal world. And one of those is going to be from bird song, and the other will be from another aspect of, say, primates. So in that sense, language perhaps is not complex. But its consequences, of course, have been. So I want, again at the outset, just to, to clear away some misconceptions, I don't want to claim that language and thought are coextensive, that they're one and the same thing. For one thing, we all know that there can be language without thought, as there are. <laughs> it's very simple. And for, for, for another thing, there can also be thought without language, as something a little bit more richer, this, richer, this uh, diagram by, by Feynman of how quantum mechanics works, the way he actually thought about it. So clearly, language and thought can't be coextensive. Right? So but on the other hand, it seems like it's actually very unique to human beings. So the question is, that makes it a very big evolutionary challenge, because evolution always works on the comparative principle. So I have four arms, or two arms and two legs. If I was a Drosophila, I could segment myself. I could get more arms, but I can't. But this is something that's common between us and many other animals. When we turn to language, however, that seems somewhat of a, of a different measure. So language can be used for communication, as I'm attempting to do now, but it can be used for many other things. It can be used for, for thought, it can be used for talking in one's sleep, and so on. Now, what were the special changes that had to take place in order to bring that about? So one might first turn to an analysis of what's happened over evolutionary time. So that's in part what Ian Tattersall talks about, and I'll show a few slides from some of his work. So in fact, we do know that brains did get bigger and they changed, but that cannot be the whole story. Uh, for example, if, if we use modern medical uh, brain imaging, we can come up with analyses that look somewhat like that. <laughs> so we know that even though brains did get bigger, and so here, this is actually a uh, drawing done by Giselle here. So brains got bigger over many millions of years until we get to this combination of Homo neanderthalensis and sapiens. The Neanderthal's brain was actually a, a bit larger than ours, although shaped, although shaped differently. So there's been a general increase in brain size. So that definitely did happen. All right, and if we actually look at, uh, say, a chimpanzee's brain, not only did the brains get bigger, but the neural circuitry as we go from rodents to carnivores to primates to us, the number of levels gets bigger, and something did indeed happen. And so to, to again, uh, here I'm following a, uh, Bertrand Russell's advice, where he said that there's a great virtue in theft over honest toil. And so what I've done is uh, I've stolen this, this scene from, uh, from Ian's work, a very fine article. And what he shows here is that along this column he has different capabilities such as images, geometric engraving, body ornaments. You can read it yourself here. And over here he has some of the Homo species, Sapiens, Neanderthalus, Heidelbergensis, and so on. You'll see that there were long periods of stasis, like in Homo erectus, where the same sorts of tools were made. These are mode two tall, two tall tools. And only very recently has there been a, a kind of burgeoning or, or flourishing of symbolic, or what we can take as proxies for symbolic behavior in the, in the idea of images, geometric engraving, and body ornaments. And they seem all associated with Homo sapiens, with us. And eventually it'll wind up 30 to 40,000 years ago, like with the uh, wonderful cave paintings that have been recently shown by uh, Ver Werner Herzog, if you've seen his film. And those people were indeed just us. So the question is, how did that happen? What was the change in some small group that makes us here different from all these other creatures? A very unique ability, a very unique ingredient. So let's consider what those ingredients might be. So we'll just take, just take two here. So it's a kind of big bang that came. So one ingredient might be, a very sophisticated ability for, for vocal learning and vocal mastery. And so I'll just play this little bit of an, 
excerpt from a, uh, a, a Bengalese finch. <laughs> That was all one song. The Bengalese finch has about the most complicated bird song amongst all the, uh, the vocal learning songbirds that we know of. And that lasts almost 10 or 10 seconds. But you can hear little repeated patterns. And the birds have to, in a very sophisticated way, learn from their male tutors. Only the, only the males sing because, as you may know, the, the bird song is used either for territorial display or to attract, uh, attract other mates. And over a period of several, uh, just about three months from a, uh, this hat hatchling over to the oldest one, you'll see that the bird actually first has a very rough syllable, and then by the time it gets down, uh, let me go back one slide. So you can see the, uh, arrives at a mature and complicated song. So those, those birds can do vocal learning and imitation. And that's probably one component that we may have drawn on. Because if you actually look at the inside of one of these bird brains, they're not so bird brain in, in an actual sense. So here are the vocal pathways in the avian brain. We shoot around in this, in this circle, and we compare it to recent imaging in human brains where there's a, this same kind of dorsal ventral processing within very homologous reasons, in regions. On the same left side of the brain, so we know that, it's very plastic at birth. And just as in people, as I said, the, the song of the finch or the, Bengali, the Bengalese finch will mature in just a few months. And after that, at the time of its so-called puberty, there are hormonal influences, and its song is then frozen. And if you think back to your own childhood, you'll realize that, yes, at puberty, there were some strange things that happened to your brain. And as we like to say as parents, the brain either matures or it immatures, depending on your point of view. But uh, we know there's definitely something that happens there. OK, so we have this very complicated vocal ability, an ability to, to learn by imitation. And evidently, that is something else that, uh, that infants and children do when they grow up. And we'll see an example in just a few minutes. But there's also something missing there. There are two main things that are missing. So let me point to the first one. The first one is this. It doesn't matter how complicated that bird song is. You saw the, the Bengalese finch song. Was, that was pretty complicated. If we actually look at it, though, it, can just, it just consists of certain repetitive patterns of syllables, like tweets and warbles, that are either arranged like beads on a string like this, or perhaps with some kind of circular pathway, as I show here, where you can go to this position here in three and then loop back so that the song is extended. So while that's, while that's sophisticated, it certainly is nothing like the kind of complicated story we'll see when we get to human language. Because human language will raise the ante on that so that it, the kind of structure we see is much more complex. So we'll come back to that in, in just a few minutes. But I want you to, to bear in mind that for bird song, it's as if you're arranging beads on a string, one after another. So it's unlike human language in that sense. OK, so what about uh, other things we might need besides vocal learning and vocal ability? Well, there, there are a couple other important cognitive capacities I want to point out. And in fact, we can return to the birds. So this is a Western scrub jay. And this is just to show you that uh, jays and corvids like this are actually fair, pretty smart. They're actually very smart. And as you can see, the, this uh, scrub jay has tied a bit of twine that it's found, or a string, around, looped it around this twig, tied around this little rock here, or pebble. And what it's going to do is actually lower that into an area where it can get some insects to crawl out on it, then pull the rock up, and then eat the insects off of it. That's pretty clever. And you'll want to keep this guy in mind, too, because this, this Western scrub jay will make an appearance at the very end of the talk. So you see the way it has dipped the, uh, the rock down. So that's one example. And then just as a related example, this is a picture of a Japanese carrion crow. And so what is it doing? It, you can see it's sort of picking at something there. 
they even show, a, I think, an even more re remarkable intelligence. So these are, are crows that are in Tokyo, the city of Tokyo. And what they will do is the following. They'll have something like a nut, like a walnut. And they'll take that walnut, and they'll look and wait until the light changes so it says it's, it's safe to cross, because they'll see the pedestrian light. They'll walk out to the, to the middle of the zebra stripe, and they'll put it down. And then they go back. The light changes. And the cars zoom back and forth, and they wait patiently. They wait till the light changes again. And they go out and they pick up the little bits that are inside from the walnut that's been crushed, and they're happy. Now, that shows an amazing amount of intelligence. It's not a strategy that works everywhere. So, for example, you do not find these crows in New York City. <laughs> and I'll bet you can imagine the reason why. It's the invisible hand of natural selection. All the crows that actually could do this have been long since been pulverized, <laughs> and we just don't see them. So, this is a picture of a, uh, of a chimpanzee using a tool. So it, like the scrub jay, it can use tools. So we can look at the chimpanzee's world, and we see that they actually are much more facile at even perhaps getting names for things or signs for things. And uh, just to show you uh, an example of this, uh, you may be familiar with the, uh, the film on, on uh, Nim Chimpsky, Project Nim, that was, came out a year and a half ago or so about teaching a, a chimpanzee sign language. Uh, in later efforts, uh, you have something like this. So anybody want to guess what this is? Anybody know what this is? This is actually, just so hold your seats. Just, this is actually the new menu system for the next version of Microsoft Word. <laughs> yes. So you're going to have to have a lot of cognitive ability to, uh, to interpret it. No, actually, in fact, what it is is a little set of, uh, of plastic pictograms that they would get the chimpanzee to try to arrange in a certain order. So in fact, just like me today, here's the, the Perrier. I don't know how they did this product placement, but they did it. But, uh, and so if it would arrange that in, cer in a certain order, it would say, oh, that means I want Perrier as opposed to Evian. I don't know. But, uh, but that's what they would try to do. But th of course, the problem with this is that uh, they have all these names for things. But quite surprisingly, apart from us as primates, most the rest of the primates, our, our near relatives, are mute, essentially. They just don't vocalize. And they don't do vocal learning. OK? so. Uh, and so that's a, that's a very interesting thing. Just to show you how this is used, here's a picture of, the, of this uh, chimp Kanzi. Now what they do seem to do is they have at least what I might call the first part of original sin, which is this, which is an apple. So if there's just a single item and a single name, it looks as though they can do that, that much, and get a recognition of a single item with a single name, like Apple. What they can't do is, is put that together with other elements or, or things that it knows and actually arrange that to make some more complex formation that has a different meaning. Okay? So meaning as such. Okay, so, so the question arises as to, well, so there, we have birds that do vocal learning, we have chimpanzees that just are able to master things like simple objects with, with just single names. But what is it that we've got that they don't have? Okay, and so I'll show, I'll show you what that is. It'll be hard to see here, but, we, but I have a slide. So this is what we Homo sapiens put together to defeat all the other species. This. That's a pencil, right? So here's... Here's our slides. We it's this. So what's so special about this? Well, what's special is that even though all animals, not all animals, I'll take that back, lots of animals we know now can do things like make tools, like we saw with the scrub jay. But there isn't any other animal besides us, it seems, that makes what I might call a combinatorial tool. So I don't know about you, but so I use both parts of this tool. I either use it to write on on this end, or then I I often use the, the other end, the eraser end, to get rid of my many mistakes, and there are many. So that's a combinatorial tool. It's been put together out of parts, separate parts. 
And that's what we do, and, when, and that's the kind of ability we have in language that you just don't see in other animals. So what you don't see is something like the following. So here's a, what you don't see is full-blown language that can assemble different concepts out of different parts and put them together in astonishingly complex ways. So here's one example out of many. Almost inconceivably, you know, the gun into which she was now staring was clutched in the pale hand of an enormous albino with long white hair. So, now, so I assure you, there's no number of monkeys typing on any number of typewriters that's ever going to come up with that. Because <laughs> it's such bad writing, right? <laughs> and that's from the Da Vinci Code, of course. <laughs> and yet, somehow you're able to, to understand that. Like, you know, you know, she's staring into this gun, uh, the gun into which she was now staring. So she's staring into the gun. That's a pretty complicated sentence. So if you actually try to draw that out, I ran this through a little you know, automatic uh, processing machine. It's a little bit hard to make out. You get a kind of st structured analysis to that sentence. So here, here's what it looks like, what, what you were taught to do in grade school. So almost inconceivably, there's this chunk here, the gun into which she was staring. And, the, and that whole thing was clutched in the pale white hand of, and here's the, the part that matches up with the albino. So you see how that already, that, see that differs from the bird song. So the bird song picture we had was something like this. It's just beads on a string, maybe with loops. What you have in human language is something that built, assembles these wonderful superstructures. Okay? So that's the secret sauce. So the question is, you know, so what is behind that secret sauce? And my contention is that it, it was actually one very small change. So we already had words. We already had this, perhaps could uh, uh, hijack this vocal learning ability. What we didn't have was this, this one special secret sauce where we, but no other animals, can take two words like eight and apples, as I show here, and then glue them together into what counts as a single new object and manipulate that with further. So I can glue eight and apples together, and it acts like a thing that's sort of verb-like. means I ate something. That's why I put eight at the top of that triangle. So it's the assembly of these little triangles that's different, and this operation that I'll call glue. So what glue does is take, it takes the, that blue circle, and that red circle glues them together and makes this hierarchically structured object. And then you can put that off in some place of your memory and glue it together with something else. I can glue eight apples together with Ian, and after that I've got a whole sentence. Ian ate apples. I'm showing two triangles there. Okay, so nothing, as I said, like that occurs in birdsong. A bird doesn't take a warble, that red, and then a blue twitter, and put them together and give it a name that's either Warble or Twitter, and then use it somewhere else. Doesn't do that. So that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen in birdsong. Okay, so it's only in language that we see this. And I want to stress that the structure that comes out is hierarchical. That is, it's like these triangles ranged one on top of another without worrying about the details inside. The parts of the triangle tells us you know, who did what to whom. So down here, that, because I had glued eight with apples into this triangle, apples is the thing that was eaten. If I had instead had glued eight with Ian down here, then Ian would have been in the worst shape. And we don't want to, so, you, so to get the meaning, you have to understand that the brain actually takes that linear sound stream and structures it into these hierarchical parts. And that's really what language is all about, because it's digital. So notice that there's, there, there can be three and four and five word sentences, but there's no such thing as a five and a half word sentence. It's actually digital in this sense. And it's structured so that this operation glue can operate over and over again to make those hideously long sentences like the one from the Da Vinci Code. They just seem to go on forever. So there's no end to it. 
That's what Chomsky refers to when he means infinite generative capacity. You can generate all kinds of sentences freely. And what Humboldt said in the middle of the 19th century, that this is the way that people make infinite use of finite means. We have this finite operation glue, we have some finite numbers of words, and then we can put them together in countless ways. That's what gives us that, that kind of creativity. So language's DNA is really coming from this kind of structure. Now, strikingly, inside our heads, it turns out, these triangles, as it were, rotate around themselves as if they were just like mobiles. So let me explain what, what I mean by that. So, in fact, the variation between languages, so let's take something like, like English and French, where you find eight apples, or you ate apples with their hands, or you have something like you're green with envy, the sort of element up here that's dictating the action or the property is sitting at the front. That's where I have it in blue. In other languages, you could just find that flipped around, the reverse. So I've done that this way, not with the, uh, the Japanese form. So in the Japanese form, you would have the verb, and then you would have, oh, sorry, you would have the object, like apples, and you'd have the verb sitting at the end. So it would be Ringo for apples and Tabata for, for eight. And similarly, with some kind of phrase like this, would be, which would be a prepositional phrase. Okay? So it's this that tells us that this is very primary for what goes on inside our heads to create actual language and to create meaning. Now, I've left something unsaid here. Okay? Because it's pretty clear that the first ind individual that ever came up with this glue operation. And so I'm assuming then this was some very short step in evolutionary time. And that makes a lot of sense because if you look back, it looks as though language emerged anytime, say, but at the latest by 50,000 years ago, let's say going back to perhaps 100 to 200,000 years ago, that's just a blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. There's not many genetic differences that there could be between us and our cousins are, who are around at the time. In fact, just this month, a very careful study was published of the DNA sequence differences between Neanderthals and humans, because they now have a, a fairly complete DNA sequence for Neanderthals. And quite surprisingly, out of the one, you know, the, about the 4.2 billion DNA letters in our genome, there are exactly 212 places where we're different from Neanderthals. That's it. That's not much of a difference. And so it was a small difference and one that took place in a relatively rapid amount of evolutionary time. So it had to be something rather simple. And so the notion here that what was relatively simple was this glue operation. So it grabbed from abilities that were found in other non-human animals and put them together. So that leaves us now with uh, lots of puzzles, but at least one important puzzle. So, you know, where did this glue operation come from? Did that just appear out of thin air? So what happens if you have the ability to, see, when I have glue, like something like eight the apples, I could chunk that into parts. So I have eight, and I have the chunk the apples. I have that ability to chunk things into parts. And I have the ability to label those parts with single uh, words. Like, as I've illustrated here, I've labeled eight, ap eight apples as eight is the label for the whole thing, and it has two constituent parts. Th but that presumes we got words here. So, suppose we don't have words to label these things. Well, I'm going to argue, so if we have this chunking ability, the way the birds have in the ability to chunk sort of linear strings, beads on a string, but no words. Is there some place we know of, if we look across all the abilities that birds and that people have, where we can see this kind of chunking and hierarchical structure, but without words? So you have to think a little bit about this. So I'm going to illustrate it just graphically here. So I'm going to take away these words and just leave asterisks behind. So I'm going to say, well, we have this ability now to 
take these two triangles together and paste them into one. But there are no words here, as there were up here with eight. They're just these little asterisks, which, which are placeholders for words. And here I put this one in red to denote that, well, maybe this one's somehow more prominent than the other. But otherwise, it's just devoid of these words like apple and ian and whatever. Now, where could that be found? Well, that's rather interesting. Is there some part of language that looks like this, but doesn't have the words? So that would be, kind of be the, uh, the uh, prefatory ability that was then put together with words to give us this kind of glue operation. Well, I'm going to show you one, at least one that I, I think might be, might be possible. So here's a little bit of my speech. And you can't recognize it from this little waveform. But what it's, what it's uh, simply saying is this. Let's have to get this guy. Uh. It's reciting the beginning of a Wordsworth poem where I say, tell me not in mournful numbers. And if you look at the beat pattern of that, you'll, say, you'll see the primary stresses here. So tell me, and then again here, not in mournful numbers. And if you actually pull that out and analyze it a little bit more, I get what, what linguists would call a metrical pattern, a beat pattern. It's more prominent in, in poetry, which is why I use this example. Aha, uh -huh. now what about beat patterns? Well, I said them with words, but the beat pattern itself, it has no words. It's just the literal pattern that you hear. So if I have something like, you know, tell, well, I can do this and everyone's ears will blow up. Tell me, tell me not in mournful numbers. I can put that together as a kind of gluing operation, a, a long sequence of them. So here I've written down an asterisk for each syllable. Tell me not in mournful numbers. Okay, so each one of these has a, a triangle associated with it. And now I'm just going to group them. I'm going to take every two as a group and put a parenthesis after it, like that. So it's just grouping. But there can't be any labels besides these funny asterisks, which are just spots for uh, making something weak or strong. So when I put them together, so I've marked the left-hand ones as red, I get a second level of structure. And now I'm just going to continue that process. I'll group, I'll group these two with parentheses. So I have just two here and then two here. And then I'm going to mark these guys as being red. And then I'll, I'll build a higher level triangle based on that. So one more to go. And now there are only just two left. And I get to the top. So what's the point about this? Well, the point is if I now strip this all away and just look at the scaffolding that's left, that's on the next slide, I get this. And that actually tells us now what the beat pattern is. So the strongest stress is on tell. So tell me not, because this has two asterisks, and mournful, that's actually the, the second highest, mournful numbers. So the simple process of grouping without words gives us what's called metrical stress. And so I'm going to advance that as sort of the, as I said, the, uh, what appeared bef before lang language as such was tied to words. So we had this ability of constructing metrical stress according to this kind of hierarchical structure. And this is, in fact, a very, well, literally primal ability in, uh, in humans. So on the next slide, I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is, a, this is a recording taken from babies actually in the first few hours after birth. And they will cry differently depending upon what kind of language they've actually been exposed to in your utero. So now your job as the audience is to guess which one of these babies is a German baby and one of them is a French baby. So I'm going to play the sounds and you'll be able to tell me, I think. So I'll click. That's one. Yeah, any guesses? Which one's a French one? Uh, it's hard being a mother, right? If you had to. We know that. So in fact, that's a typical French cry. 
because it follows the international contrast. Papa, right? And in German, it's Papa. That's the second one. That's a typical German cry. And that's because of the stress system of the language. So what I want to point out to you is that that's there extremely early in our ability to pick out what's going on with language. And it exists before the baby's actually, the baby's not asking for milk or anything, it's just crying. It's not saying, I want a bottle of milk. It hasn't used the words. And even more recently, just last week, uh, was a, a very wonderful publication of a study that tried to take that even further. So they wanted to figure out, well, is this ability to distinguish this kind of metrical stress, does that exist before you're born? Now, you can't do you know, these, these imaging experiments and these recordings, obviously. You can't do those on unborn kids. It's just not, just not possible to do, and it violates all, ki all kinds of uh, ethical considerations. So what these people did was something very clever. They took extremely premature infants, about 29 weeks to 30 weeks of gestation. Here's an example. And these are children who are so premature that the cortical folds of the brain, they actually have it partly imaged here, have not yet fully developed. Right? That's how immature they are. And yet these children, too, could pick out the metrical stress of the particular language that they were you know, going to be born into. They were already attuned to that. Okay, so that's kind of remarkable. Now, so what's, what's, the, uh, what's the point about that? Well, the point about that is that, so this is something very distinctive that humans have. This ability not only to construct complicated syntax, but to have something like metrical stress. Ah, so now let's, now let's go back to the birds. So this is a particular bird song. So let me see if I can just play this one. Yeah, that's a, a zebra finch, much, much simpler song. And if I pull that out and analyze one part of the frequency spectrum here, okay, that has a pattern of high and low beats, which is exactly like the kind of pattern you find in human language. And so you can go through and look at the different kinds of patterns of metrical stress in human language and in birds, because it does vary, as I showed you, from one language to another, in German versus French and so on. And it's, it turns out you can account for them by the same kind of triangle construction, the, that assembly of little triangles I showed you, okay, but without words. And that's great, because that's the second thing that, of course, that birds lack. They don't have words. It's only in Walt Disney movies that you actually hear them talking. Right? But they definitely do singing. Now, you may think that's a little bit far-fetched, but it actually wasn't so far-fetched for this guy. And this, of course, is an, an, a picture of Darwin in his, uh, his old age. Because Darwin had this kind of view also, the same sort of theory about the, uh, the way that evolution could have brought uh, language into, into being. And it's this one where the, the notion of the birds that can do song, that precedes actual language. So I sometimes, I like to call it the uh, Caruso theory of the uh, evolution of language. So here's the section from uh, The Descent of Man and selection in relation to se sex, I think published about 1871. And I'll highlight the, the, the section here. Uh, and then his second part. I just, and I just wanted to read this directly because he said that, uh, he said that, uh, that man uses his voice largely and probably did as one of the given apes of present day in producing true mu musical cadences. Right? So that's the... That's the notion of uh, the first act of this evolutionary opera that Darwin came out, out with. So expressing various emotions like love, jealousy, and so on. So the imitation by articulate sounds of musical cries might have given rise to this expression of complex emotions. 
So that was act one of what Darwin supposed. But then he went on past that to suggest a second act, the one that I uh, just showed you. So the first act was external singing and rhythm. That was, that was drawn from birds. And the second part that I've, I've shown here is that he then said that the, the mental powers in some early progenitor might have been more highly developed. And he sort of is vague about that. But as he points out, that this power, once you insert words into this, into this kind of song, as soon, soon as you have a, a song with words, true language, he points out how important this is for thinking generally. So as he said, a long and complex train of thought can no more be carried out without the aid of words, whether spoken and silent, than that you can do algebra without actually doing some kind of calculation. Okay, so though, that's Darwin's libretto for the origin of language. Right, so if that was true, and then we had then brought together something like metrical structure along with words, especially in us, then that, of course, would be an immense amount of, uh, of uh, cognitive ability. Because such a creature would have the ability to plan, to think about the future, to think about things that were not, not in the here and now, all these things that we see about language, which comes out to be something like a, a Swiss army knife if you actually think about it. And it's rather interesting because if we look at the three things that are people ordinarily think about that are tied up with language, I'll show you in the next three slides, they all seem to, to come together at the same point. So here's one. So if I have this glue operation, and I have a, a funny kind of mental dictionary that just has one element, say one, right? And I just successively apply glue to it I get something that uh, might look like this with the parentheses. Glue, 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 glue. So that's like the number five. So it gives us all the integers. Now this is very striking because that's something that chimpanzees never master, but every kid masters just about the same time they get their full syntax and language, around age two or so. And then they understand that these numbers can go on forever. They have no problem with that. Just like the, I could successively put more of these glue operations together. So people go on forever. The apes are always stuck at between 7 and 10, and they just use some kind of analogical or quantity type of, of reasoning. So, so if we wire up glue to this instead of just to regular words, we get the beginnings of mathematics, something else that's very special with us. But there's still more. So if I can wire up glue to another system that we already saw, so this one, let me see if this will come out or not. Yeah, that's nice. So you see the beat pattern there, which I've projected down from the notes. And here the grouping's a little more complicated. But if you again group it essentially in a binary way and then project downwards, you get the actual rhythmic structure that's behind that little bit of music. So music too, it appears, could actually be part of that same system. So you notice that beat that came right here, the strong beat on that measure. And in fact, this has been looked at by linguists recently. So on the left you have, I don't know how the sound is working, but let's just see if I can get, it's nice, so nice to hear. Anyway. The uh, opening of Mozart's K330 piano sonata. That has more structure. See, we could listen to that and have fun with it. So that has more structure, but the, the grouping here isn't words. These little eyes and so forth are tonics and subtonics that you can show that it's actually been constructed out, out of. And if you look back at this and then can remember the albino sentence, although this one is of surpassing beauty compared to the albino nonsense, it has structural elements that are the same. And I've often wondered what, what happened in Mozart's case since he started out so young, that somehow the wiring of his generative abilities with glue and language 
that crosswired with these musical abilities, and he was able to write music as easily as you and I can speak. Something to think about. So this kind of rhythmic structure also exists in music. So we put that together. Let's see if we can just go. So, so what do we have? What we have is, so in the beginning actually, in fact then, if this is true, in the beginning was the word. But in this interesting way, the fact that we had words in the sense of the way chimpanzees do, of something like apple. Okay, so, but in addition to words, we had to have this metrical structure along with song. And if we put those two together, we actually get the combination that raises us from being something like Homo sapiens or Homo neanderthalus to something I like to call Homo combinans, because we can combine and recombine our language in endless ways. So those are the two elements, I think, that preceded language and gave us things more glorious than pencils. It gave us things like Mozart. So what I'd like to do is to conclude just to, sh to show you again, to bring, bring back our friend, the uh, re Western scrub jay, and to show you while the scrub jays and the corvids and the crows are very smart, okay, so they can do things like this, tie something into a knot, they could, do never, they could never have done something as clever as the next part, which is they might have be, been able to make a, uh, to mix a drink. Uh, just a drink, a martini, shaken, not stirred. But they couldn't have said that. And that, I think, is in part the essence of all of human nature. And with that, I'd like to thank you and take, que take questions. I don't know how you're doing the mic. You're doing the mic somehow. Thank you very much, Bob. That was very provocative. There's a it's microphone. In there. In there. Two microphones now that will be circulated. In if you are interested in asking Professor Berwick a question, just hold up your hand and one of the ladies will bring a mic to you. There's one in the rear. I'll let you do it from now on. It's fine, thanks. As time, as time goes by, we see the differences between you know, what has been said as far as between beast and, and, and man becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. What would you say those differences are uh, currently, your current thinking is, without the risk of, uh, you know, with the risk without of being proven, uh, disproven by your students in the future? And then also as far as with uh, animals, as far as dolphins, um, uh, killer whales, also elephants. Right. W what do we see the differences there? And then also as far as time, the future of time and planning, is that something that is universally uh, different between yeah, man so and Yeah, so there's, those are all, there's three excellent questions. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to actually say something where I can be proven wrong, else, else I'm not doing my job as a scientist, but that's, but that's fine, but just to, just to say that. Um, a, as I've examined, as I do a lot of this genomic biology too, and as you, as you actually look at these differences, say between us and uh, now extinct species or even chimpanzees and so forth, and what they can do. They're extremely intelligent. And as Ian Tarasol sometimes has said, it looks like that's almost the maximum you can do if you just have a purely associationist view of interacting directly with the world. You can do extremely clever things. And what seems to be different about us is that once we had this ability to have words that were hooked together into very complicated phrases, we literally build in, inside our, our minds, minds slash brains, actual models or replicas of you know, what might be in the outside world. So just as, as a good example, in fact, the, uh, this apple's a good example. So uh, Laura Petito, who was one of the, the people that worked on the project uh, you know, NIM uh, business so many years ago, pointed out that although the, the chimpanzee that she helped learn sign language could figure out this was, was an apple, its notion of an apple wasn't exactly our notion of an apple. Its notion of an apple was, oh, an apple is something that it would either associate with, oh, it was in the same drawer as the knife that was used to cut it, or it was in the same place as some other bit of food. It was all pure associationist. What we're able to do with language is detach ourselves from that completely. And that's very difficult because then when we look at other animals, we're constantly projecting that. 
and it's very hard to get away from. So in that respect, to answer in part this question, which is a good one about what happens with dolphins and whales and elephants, because these have all been brought up. It looks like in terms of these sort of basic cognitive capacities, as you say, the differences between us and them get narrower and narrower in a certain sense. But they don't seem to have this ability about language and so are able to detach themselves from the here and now. It's as if they're, they are in fact living in the eternal present and they don't have any way to dissociate themselves from that. And all the, all the things you do when you actually analyze their so-called communication signals turn out to be like the ones of the finches, even though they're, they're quite sophisticated in and of themselves. So I know that didn't answer all the parts to your question, but geez, lots of hands. Uh, I don't know, front row. Yes. Oh, who had, yeah, there was someone who had their hand up earlier. I guess we'll go by precedence. So they have um, the microphone? Yeah, I'm yeah, going back to the point about uh, the intonations being adopted by the ling or the, of the language yes. by the baby, even the premature babies. Yes. Any possibility of genetics at work there, or is it all learned? That's, that's a good question. I don't think we know the different. I mean, since unless you have a different sort of metaphysics than I have, you don't know where you're going to be born next time, right? But you maybe so you, you have to actually be labile enough. Yeah, you could you could try to do it, and that's not a bad that's not a bad thing to try, actually try to do. I don't think anyone's tried to look at that, right? He said well, he said well why don't you could look at people who are adopted in different in different uh, cultures. So that would that would try to get rid of the fact that, oh, if I had, quote, the genes of you know, some particular area. But in fact, what we know about the genetics of language is such that it's very hard to pick out any population level differences. So if I take you know, uh, a, a, some baby that's born in the middle of, a, of an Amazonian swamp and bring them to Boston, they'll develop this horrible accent or the Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, it just happens that way. We're, so we're, we're built so that we're labile enough to learn any possible human language. But the possible human languages are in fact restricted. Not anything goes. As I said here, you have to use these sorts of triangle shapes. And if I had time to talk about linguistics, I could show you that there are certain restrictions on what you can do, even though Dan Brown looks like he violates them all the time. <laughs> so, so I don't know who is next. Lots of hands. Maybe I should have had numbers. Yes. yes. Two, two questions. Um, further to what you just responded to, um, what about a bilingual family mm -hmm. and a um, in utero child? Ah. That's the first. Shall I go on with the second, or do you want to answer first? Well, l l let's try the first one. We'll see, we'll see where it goes. So. Uh, I don't think they've actually, that, that's an excellent uh, study to do. So I don't know of, of someone where they've actually had a child that was exposed in utero to two languages and then said, and then see how their cry is going to come out. Uh, that's an excellent uh, suggestion. I don't know of anyone that's done that. So uh, as I said, it looks like we're labile enough. And with bilingual and trilingual and so on environments, it looks like the children are, are able to partition off those languages in some way we don't quite understand. So they, they don't really mix them up. So if anything, it looks like it facilitates yeah, uh, their true. abilities. Yeah. So, the other uh, thing is, um, for a deaf and dumb person from birth, yes. how do they, without language as we know it, think? What, what co yes. comprises their thought process? Yeah, th th this is a wonderful question that uh, I actually talk about from time to time. So uh, what happened to the, the, there are these cases of people like Helen Keller, for example. Well, she was able to Well, uh, Well, actually, here's, the, here's what we uh, at least seem to know. This is actually an interesting uh, line of work. It's actually something that uh, Carol Chomsky, who was uh, uh, Noam's wife, actually worked on a great deal. There's a method that's called the Tadoma method. And what happens is that if you are, say, past a, a year old and you lose your ability to hear and see, the way you can learn language is by putting your fingers on the, the side of someone's mouth and cheek to feel the vibrations. And what's rather astonishing about that to me is that such people, as with uh, Helen Keller, although she was even more remarkable than 
uh, exceptional, are able to learn or acquire language as if it's just their ordinary language. And they can talk about colors, they can talk about sizes and shapes, things they couldn't have possibly, you would have thought, actually encountered given that their entire world is both silent and dark. And that's a rather dramatic thing. Uh, and so such people, of which there are quite an, actually uh, some number, but fewer now, because uh, these usually happen during uh, things like uh, meningitis infections and things like that. So the one constraint that does appear to be operative is that if this happens uh, before about seven to eight months, when you first begin to actually uh, produce individual sounds or, you have, or hear all these sounds, if it happens very early, like about one or two months, then you can't acquire language by this Tadoma method. So that's, that's what we know about that. So it's rather astonishing that you can get as rich, as full an inner life from language from the, as long as this happens after, say, age eight, eight months or a year. Oh, but does that answer the thought? How do they think without, I don't think that. Well, as far as we can tell, I mean, that, that's why that's actually a, one, one line of argument is that uh, if language is tied, as I said, it's not coextensive with thought, but it's, of course, closely tied to it, in some way that gets wired up the right way, and they think perfectly well, just like Helen Keller. And we know this happens with blind children who are able to talk about colors and reason about them equally well. But you're right, there's still a lot of mystery there about how that, uh, how that happens. Uh, we have lots of, cho lots of choice. We should have done this on eBay. I could have <laughs> bid for things. Can you keep your hands up for a second just so I can find yeah. uh, So my question is about the Paraha Trying tribe. To locate. Oh, oh, Paraha, yes. Yeah, Very um, oh, I see they, they only count to three. Beyond that, it's many. They don't have a concept of zero. Yeah. And then te the tenses, they only have a present tense, really. So. Well, in all due respect to the people that have you know, done these articles on this, uh, just to de deflect that a little, you, the, these Parara Indians that are in the Amazon, they actually only live like a couple kilometers from a main, one of the main highways and do trading perfectly well. So a, uh, a couple of linguists have gone down there recently and found out that if you get them in the right situations, they, can, they do fine. So like table tennis. They can count in table tennis. <laughs> and they know when they're winning. So it's, so no, they actually, they actually can, can count past that. So I think uh, uh, quite a few of these things have to be examined pretty carefully because uh, I, th I think if you, as soon as they get exposed to the, the right kinds of uh, external stimuli, so the ability is okay. there even though they haven't used it so far, is what you mean? Well, they don't, they t uh, this often happens in, ab in, uh, in Aboriginal cultures. If you don't need these, these numbers, you don't use them. So you, just, you could say right. two hands to mean 10 or something else. Right. So it's going to be a very tricky thing to actually discern. Is that one in the back? What is the relationship between language and the rate at which the mind measures time? Ah. Well, that's, that actually is also an excellent question because we don't specifically have you know, superb fix on how thought is proceeding in time. And so measuring that against language is always tricky. So you can do this thing about having people count out time in their heads and shadow it with language. Uh, they seem to be roughly uh, comported with one another. But I think that could be easily an illusion. Now, I don't have any much further expertise about that. Actually, you'll find if you read one of Feynman's autobiographical works, he and a, a group of physicists amuse themselves for several months with this at, uh, at Princeton, but uh, I'm just not an expert on the phenomenological interior metric of time. Okay. Um, first, before my question, I know, uh, I'm trying to pick out where on that, hi, ah, sorry. There you are. Um, before my question uh, about the matter of the uh, people born deaf and dumb in the 19th century, terminology at least, uh, on the same page of descent you were on, Darwin mentions uh, a young woman who he got the anecdote about who um, was born deaf and dumb, pink born, um, and used sign language while she was dreaming. 
and he felt that was an illustration of the structure of thought and the structure of language being going together. Uh, my actual question was, um, some of this was implicit, but uh, do you feel a circa 200,000 years ago, a little before that, a direct human ancestor was musically vocalizing with beats uh, extensively, and does this account for the structure of the human vocal tract, which otherwise would be problematic and probably not evolve, and also the brain areas, Broca's areas, etc.? Well, I think I think that's certainly plausible. I've, I've been looking at the uh, you know the archaeological evidence of the sort that uh, Ian looks at, and the difficult part is actually finding any proxies so you can actually determine whether that was actually happening or not. It doesn't, seem, it doesn't leave much of a trace, except, as you say, through these, these indirect avenues. And that, well, that's the challenge. My problem is it's kind of... Um, Can't test it. How, how else would we have been pre-adapted? I'm, I'm of one mind with you. I think that these were pre-adaptations or ex-adaptations, if you like, Steve Gould. Uh, and and they, they were there and then brought together. I just, I just don't know of a way, absent the time machine, to actually, actually go and you know, figure out, oh yes, this happened versus this. So uh, that, it's my hope that something like that was so, but that doesn't make it a scientific hypothesis. So we've got one more in the Lots back. If you people. still have a question, if you can put your hand up so we can see you. I think you'd like to find one person, but we've got one more in the back. Some people have their hands way up. They must have um, you had a slide earlier where, we had a slide, you had a slide earlier where you showed a comparative brain image scan of a bird singing and a human, and you said that they had similar patterns. And I was just curious, maybe this is similar to the previous question, but I'm curious, um, why is it you think that they have similar structures when it does this stuff in the brain, even though it seems like the bird brain and the human brain have evolved for a very, very Well, they're, in, they're independent. So in that case, as the uh, evolutionary people would say, that those are independent evolution, you know, evolutionary paths, just like a bat's wings versus a bird's wings. They happened along, because we're very long separated from, uh, from birds, from aves, so about 600 million years total, I think, and that, that's a long time. So there are what they call, at least in this literature, they call them homologous brain regions. So they're roughly the same you know, shape and same position, but, and they've been then recruited for the, the pathways have been recruited to do the same things, right. And that happens all the time. So there's some underlying structural benefit to these things being organized in this way? Is that... You know, deficit to the, the pathways that you yeah, I mean see? If, yeah, because if these things evolved completely independently, like, why would they look so similar? Like, well, because, well in, part, in part because the, it's the motor pathways to control things like breathing. So birds had to do that in order to fly. They have to, they have, to have partly autonomous control of their breathing. And you may realize, of course, that you do too. So you don't, but yet when you go to sleep, of course, you just don't collapse. Your breathing carries on normally. But you have to have control of your breathing in order to speak. So those same regions were recruited analogously. And the same seems to be roughly true of things like vocal learning, which the birds have to do. They have to listen, imitate what the male tutor is, is doing, and, and so on. But the matchup isn't exact, because as you say, the human brains are very different. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, but we're going to have yes. to close after one more question. Uh, <laughs> the museum has, has its own up. constraints. And How's we're going to have waving? Uh, has, has, anyone, so has anyone ever investigated uh, with other species whether prenatal vocalizations heard affects the vocalization patterns of the newborn? Oh, that's a great idea. I, d I don't know of one, but there might be. But that's a great idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Oh, you